اعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين رحمه للعالمين ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد وعلى اهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وال وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الدين عند الله الاسلام زينوا مجالسكم بالصلوات على محمد وال محمد اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد uh, my respected brothers and sisters and elders throughout the globe salam alaykum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh question is religion and the modern world compatible keep that question in the back of your mind inshallah we'll return to it as we begin our discussion our conversation in the subsequent days and evenings and event and timings i want to begin by saying and stating some scientific data and some scientific facts our world increasingly has become more and more economically prosperous that is industrial economies have grown in the past few years especially prior to the crisis that we're currently facing we were in a boom period that is the economy was flourishing in many respects uh, for 10 years or so and we were seeing economies such as the united states europe and also developed economies such as uh, china's or developing economies such as india emerging yet at the same time as the data has been extremely clear about prosperity and wealth increasing the data has also shown that we also live in a world where unhappiness in society is increasing substantially that means that people are dissatisfied with life although they may have economic prosperity although they may have wealth although they may have the financial resources at the same time that that financial and economic well-being is not necessarily translating to actually tranquility and peace of mind and peace of heart and peace of spirit therefore the conversation that you and i will be having is with respect to islam in modern society its ethics its philosophy and its spirituality trying to understand what are the tools if any that can help you and i actually have tranquility and peace of mind in our societies there's been numerous research that has looked at this problem that i've alluded to already that is that how is it possible that at one moment in time and two pictures are both true at the same time one picture that economically things have been improving when you look at the previous years however as bank balances have increased as economic economies have flourished so too parallel to the same picture dissatisfaction anxiety depression concerns about general well-being happiness at large if we take that term has been decreasing as wealth has increased happiness has decreased it's important here to define the term happiness what do we mean when we say happiness here when we say happiness are we referring to for example happiness that is transient in nature that is happiness that oh i will do something to get pleasure in this moment or am i looking for longer term sustained happiness when researchers look at happiness in the academic sphere they divide happiness into two types the first is hedonic and the second is relating to sustained or long term hedonic refers to moment to moment pleasures for example that may be for someone eating a nice meal or it may be for other people seeking out what we one would deem immoral activities that is not the type of a happiness that we're relating to and we're discussing here we are talking about that type of happiness with respect to sustained long term peace of mind and tranquility contentment one where i'm able to live my life and at the same time not be in a constant state of being and stress and anxiety and constantly worried also it's important to note when we use these terms such as stress depression anxiety there is it's important to note there is a chemical and a scientific and a biological element to this we will not be discussing it from that net point of view necessarily we will be discussing these terms from a sociological perspective 
looking at two societies where all other factors are constant, except for these traits that we're looking at, how is it that one society compared to another society may have higher rates of anxiety, depression, fear, all other things constant? So for example, there has been numerous research throughout the years and throughout the eras that has found that industrial economies, wherever they may be, in the East or in the West, has actually led to an increase in people's rates of depression, anxiety, mental illness, and also suicide in the ultimate sphere. This is in environments compared to other environments that may not be so developed economically. So for example, if you take certain countries that are very well developed in Western Europe, for example, in North America, for example, and compare them to other countries that are in developing economies or underdeveloped economies as they're classified, such as, for example, in Africa and Asia, and you compare the two, you will find there's more general prosperity in terms of Western Europe and the United States, or even Korea for that matter, South Korea. But at the same time, you will also find that generally in terms of dissatisfaction, as illustrated by depression, anxiety, and the likes, or also just not being happy based on survey data, you will find that many times developed economies are leading in unhappiness. Why is that? How is that? This is what we hope to investigate and look at in the next few days and nights when we discuss this topic, wherever we may be. So our solution in analyzing this and trying to explore this reality is looking at Islam in a modern society. So we'll have to tackle a few questions here. Number one, are religion and modern society compatible or not? What have researchers said in this department? And if they are compatible, in which ways are compatible? That is, what traits does religion at large and Islam in particular espouse or encourage people to adopt so that we can be happier and more tranquil in life? Because if you look at this question of happiness, there's the old adage of the individual who was by the sea, who was just playing by the sea. And a man walked by that person who was playing by the sea. He was doing whatever his work was by the sea. And he was just playing with the, with the sand or the rocks or the things. And then a man passed by and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just playing about. I'm just, uh, you know, having a good time. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I'm doing that by, by playing by the sea. And the man says, well, why aren't you working? Why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you doing something productive? He says, he says, why would I do that? And the man was saying that, well, you should do something productive so that you can actually get an income. You can work. You can get some income in your life. He says, okay, that, that sounds interesting. Well, why would I want to do that? So you can actually get income, save income, and use that income. He said, okay, so why would I want to use that income? Well, eventually, he says, if you work, you'll work enough to a point where you'll get this uh, income, and you'll actually be able to what we would call retire. You'll actually get that savings, and you'll be able to retire with it. He said, okay. If I retire, then what can I do? He said, well, when you can retire, then you can play about by the sea and do whatever you want. He said, well, I'm doing that right now anyways. So why would I want to do what you're saying? Uh, so I can waste all so many years of my life in order to eventually get back to where I am right now. It's a, a metaphor for something higher. And that higher point that I'm driving at is it's possible to work. It's possible to get a source of living an income, which is a responsibility and a requirement for the modern world and for a sense of purpose in society. But at the same time, that does not have to compromise necessarily your sense of being in life. You don't have to necessarily be miserable while also becoming prosperous in economic terms and in general terms. Therefore, we want to look at how religion can give us solutions, practical solutions to our modern dilemmas of society. That is, how can we, as the old adage goes, have our cake and eat it too? How can we have prosperity to make the world a better place, but at the same time, not lose our sense of mental tranquility? And this topic is in discussion is very important, very pertinent, especially for the changing dynamics of our society today and the crisis that we're facing and how our mental clarity, our mental traits, and how our peace of mind is most important at this point in time. Therefore, why these particular dimensions of religion? That is, why philosophy? Why ethics? Why spirituality? Philosophy allows us within the Islamic framework to look at and to actually think clearly so we can make rational decisions in society. Therefore, we'll be lending on philosophy as well as psychology and behavioral economics in this discussion. What does that mean? And why is that important? 
The reason that is that is important is because you may not realize it or we may not realize it, but there are certain cognitive biases that we as a society adopt and they actually act and lead to us thinking irrationally. There's a very good book on this entitled Predictably Irrational by a uh, behavioral economist by the name of Dr. Dr. Dan Ariely, who is a student of Dr. Daniel Kahneman. And he highlights this point that human beings are not only at times irrational, but we're actually predictably irrational. That is, we are irrational in a predictable manner. This is actually what Dr. Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler and others won the Nobel Prize in economics for, for actually understanding that mankind were not necessarily always rational. And things that emerge from this understanding is, for example, a 25 cent aspirin versus a $2 aspirin. Which one do you think is more effective in human beings? The data actually shows that a $2 aspirin is more effective in people compared to a 25 cent aspirin. But here's the catch, here's the kicker. The researchers actually gave the exact same medicine to both individuals for headaches. That is, there was no difference in reality between the $2 and the 25 cent aspirin or ibuprofen or acetaminophen or whatever your headache medicine of choice is. But the researchers found that the perception of something being more ex expensive naturally translated in people's minds as this being something that is better in quality. And that's not necessarily the case. This is one example of many other biases that philosophy and psychology can help us think more clearly about and get better solutions. Because that will help prevent us from this phenomenon of, for example, keeping up with the Joneses. Much of our tranquility is lost in living a way where we're not thinking clearly. I'm thinking, what does my neighbor have? What does my society have? And at that point in time, that leads to unhappiness. And when we think philosophically and logically, we're able to realize that, you know, those things that I thought I needed, I may not need as much as I think. And this time that we're going through during this lockdown and the coronavirus and all those challenges is a great time to reflect and introspect, especially in the month of Ramadan, to do tafakkur and tadabbur on the verse of the Quran al-Majid wa furqan al-Hamid and actually contemplate and use our reason to understand this faculty that Allah has given us of reason in order that he has given it to us so that we can be ashraf if we utilize its potential. That is ashraf al-makhluqat, the best of Allah's creation, if we utilize our intellect. And the utilization of that intellect will help us understand that many of those things that we thought were important, having the nice car, having the nice house, having the nice X, Y, and Z material item may not be as happiness inducing, that means it may not give us as much happiness as we thought compared to, for example, giving in the way of charity, gratitude, for example, volunteering, for example, for example, philanthropy. The science shows that many of these things are a lot more likely to actually increase happiness in your life and tranquility in your life. And this is what religion has been saying for time immemorial, but I'll let the data speak for that when the time comes for that. Therefore, philosophical thinking so we can think clearly about things and not get confused in matters and understand our priorities. This environment that we're living in currently with the lockdown, with the virus, it has helped many people realize that we do need certain things to live in society, but we may not need as much as we think. Some of those luxuries are now coming to light that we were actually living, we're actually living fine without them. Yes, we need income. Yes, we need food on the table. Yes, we need clothes on our backs. But you'll realize that sometimes you can actually make ends meet. Man is very resilient. Uh, and many times you can allocate those resources in other places. So, but we'll come to that. The a second element is ethics. What traits can you and I adopt in our lives so that we can have mental tranquility and peace and happiness in our lives? That is, does do the traits of, for example, that one may adopt impact how we are and being? In this, we will look at the domain of Islamic knowledge in particular, and what type of akhlaqi traits Islam is highly emphasized that can actually scientifically be shown to give us tranquility in our life. For example, humility. What about the different dimensions of humility, such as intellectual humility? You know, we live in a world of polarization today. Wherever you go in the globe, there are the haves, the have-nots, the political party on one side and the political party on the other side, the my view versus your view, the us's and the them's. Us and them thinking has led to a society of polarization where people are many times, even in emergencies, are becoming irrational. 
in things of saying that we won't find, we won't follow the science, we won't follow the rational elements of the equation. And people on the other side may develop other elements and other arguments. Intellectual humility in our nations, in our communities, in our societies, and in our families, and in our personal lives, in our friend circles, can be extremely important to not only understand the perspective of others, it can actually be very helpful in actually calming and giving us a sense of tranquility. As the old saying goes, that bitterness is like that poison, it's like drinking poison and hoping it harms the other person. Or bitterness is that vessel, is that poison that erodes the vessel that carries it more than whatever it is poured upon. So you will find through the philosophy, through the ethics, that the solutions to living a more tranquil life can actually lead you to have that tranquility and peace of mind. And we'll discuss what those traits are from the philosophical Islamic perspective, as well as from the perspective of science. What does the science say about how you can have ethics lead you and leave us to society to have a better world and a better society? And finally, the kernel of the matter, the root of the matter that we're striving towards, which is spirituality. Our world today is starving for spirituality. Even those individuals who have come forward and says we have said, we don't need religion in the modern society. Religion is an outdated phenomenon. Those individuals, even many of them recognize that spirituality has its place. Spirituality is very important. And we will look at how important this concept is and how we can implement it in our lives so that we have a sense of meaning of higher meaning, of higher purpose, of higher understanding in our lives so that we can be more tranquil in our lives. These are the elements that we hope to discuss. The next layer of the analysis is we have two goals and two objectives here. The first is that we implement clear thinking through philosophy, ethical moral traits through the ethics discussion, and then adopt spirituality so that we can better ourselves as individuals, number one, and as individuals, we'll impact our families and our social circles. So it's improvement, self-improvement at the individual level, number one. Number two, it is actually, this discussion is helpful and fruitful for not only helping us at the individual level. I mentioned at the onset, our world is getting more prosperous. Now, with the exception of the current circumstance, this is an anomaly, and this is a circumstance which is very dire, and we're monitoring that situation in terms of the current economic crisis. But generally, with wealth and with income increasing, happiness has gone down, as I mentioned earlier. Well, we, as Muslims, are members of our greater societies. We are members of the European community. We are members of the American society. We are members of the Canadian society. We are members of the global community. Therefore, by means of us understanding philosophy and ethics and spirituality, we hope and aspire to make our countries, that is the United States, Europe, uh, the European nations, India, Canada, wherever we may be living, we hope to make our countries and by virtue of that, our world a better place by sharing our insights in terms of what we've understood, in terms of actually being better people, and in terms of helping our society at large. These are extremely pivotal points. This is what makes this a most timely and most pressing conversation for us to have so that you and I can work towards making our world a better place. I began, and I begin with this verse of the Quran and Majid that in the and Allah al Islam, verily the religion near Allah is Islam. And in our belief system and in our understanding, Islam is that Islam which has going, been going from Adam until our time. And Islam is that complete way of life. Well, if Islam is a complete way of life, which we believe, a complete way of life must provide solutions for our lives. And I am here to argue that indeed, Islam does provide practical solutions for our life practical solutions that you and I can actually understand and actually implement in our lives so we have more tranquility in our lives, so we have more peace of mind in our lives, so we actually have those traits that are the most valuable in our lives so that we can do better. But there are certain layers that we will have to cover. For example, we will have to cover philosophy from the perspective of where does our knowledge come from? Where does our understanding come from? If you look at philosophers of the past, many of them would say that if you look at, you don't need to tell me who you are. All you have to tell me is what time and what space do you live in? So for example, 
Nietzsche or other philosophers, for example, would say that, well, you can tell me, I don't need to know a word that you say. All I need to know is, do you live in, for example, do you live in India in 2020? Do you live in China in 2010? Do you live in, for example, America in 1800? Wherever you may be, if you can tell me two things, your time and your space, I myself, the philosopher, can tell you your thoughts. This is what philosophers have held in the past. Why? Because they argued that the environment in one, in, in the time and space in which one exists has a tremendous impact on the thoughts that you and I have. You may discover that your thoughts and my thoughts and our thoughts are not necessarily our own. And I want you to reflect on that. And if you're not convinced about that, I would implore you to bear with us so we actually can make an argument for that. I don't want you to be convinced right away. I want you to think about this. And I want us to reflect on this. Remember, over 700 verses of the Quran, Al-Majid wal furqan Al-Hamid, refer to tafakkur and tadabur, reflection and contemplation and thinking about our world and our universe and our society at the physical level, physical sciences, as well as at the, at the spiritual and social sciences level. What is going on in our world? What kind of world do we live in? What kind of planets are out there? What kind of society is out there? We should be thinking about the betterment of our society. And indeed, many of us are. And I want to have this conversation so we can push that forward. You know, when we discuss philosophy and ethics and spirituality, these have not been thought of for any trivial reason. It's very important to discuss this. Why? Dr. Peter Adamson, a professor who actually compiled an entire book entitled Philosophy in the Islamic World, he was invited to give a talk at Google and many other institutions. And he said in his research that I'm always asked, and it's always startling for people to hear, Islam and philosophy be used in the same sentence. By the way, when we mention philosophy, we're referring to is philosophy in terms of logic, philosophy in terms of the one that is related to, the, in, in line with the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, in teachings of the Quran, aligned with that, and not anything that is divergent from that necessarily. We're talking about philosophy that may be accepted by the Hawza, for example. We're talking about philosophy that is in line with mainstream Islam. We're not talking about divergent philosophy that is something that is off the rails. That is an important point to note. But with respect to the point that I'm making, with respect to why this need for Islam and philosophy, this need for Islam and ethics, this need for Islam and spirituality, Dr. Peter Adamson said that people are astonished about how Islam and philosophy are used in the same sentence. And he argued that Islam is an extremely rich history of philosophy, yet many people are not aware. What I would argue also, many people are not aware of the deep and rich spiritual dimensions of Islam, in addition to the philosophical. Many people are not aware of the deep ethical roots of Islam. And it's our responsibility to understand them first as individuals, as practicing Muslims. Number one, understand it, know it. And number two, once we understand it, we get a seat at the table and we actually tell others about this rich tradition. You may find that your colleagues at work, your colleagues at university, your colleagues at school, your friends that are people who don't know much about Islam, not necessarily for any fault of their own, just because they have a particular narrative that they've heard, you may find that these very same individuals would be very keen to hear about what true Islam is. What are the philosophical dimensions of Islam? What are the ethical dimensions of Islam, for example? And what are the spiritual dimensions of Islam? So this progression I want you to keep in mind for the next subsequent nights and days, that is philosophy of Islam, Islamic philosophy, to provide clear thinking, clarity of mind, so we're not subject to cognitive biases, so we're not subject to logical fallacies. Why is this important? Again, this is important because in our world today, many times we are living in a world of misinformation. In fact, with the AI boom, the artificial intelligence boom that will take place in the subsequent years, Outlets are saying and researchers are saying it may be very difficult, if not impossible, to discern true truth from falsehood. The news that we will get through social media, through, the, through other outlets, we will be confused as to what is truth and what is reality. And if you don't have clarity of thought, you may be purporting things that are not factually true. Not because of any fault of your own, just because it will be so difficult. Think about this for a moment. In your own social networks, in WhatsApp groups, and other things that are, messages that are forwarded to you on a day-to-day -day basis, how much, for example, misinformation or uh, misguiding information is in many of these? 
not necessarily for any fault of the person who forwarded it, but just because it's a perpetuation of the challenges of lack of clarity of thought. So we hope to address this in our conversation by tackling things such as knowing yourself, knowing who you are, understanding that from the Islamic principle, that one who understands themselves understands their, their Lord, understands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an amazing statement. So the first level of knowing yourself, the second one being intellectual humility. How have our Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, how have our scholars of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, that is the Maraja and the rightful scholars, how have they practiced intellectual humility? And how has that led them to clearer insights? And how can we adopt this in our lives? Also looking at, for example, cognitive biases from philosophy, but also from psychology and understanding how is it that our society may direct us in one way and it's our responsibility to stop, pause, reflect, and see what is the reality of the matter. And then the ethical dimensions, Islamic ethics. What is the tradition that is overcoming, for example, societal perceptions? By the way, this is a continuum. The clarity of thought from the Islamic philosophy. And, for example, the ethical framework that is adopting the traits of akhlaq. That is the traits of gratitude, of humility, of, for example, not tying ourselves to societal customs in a negative sense. Or, for example, staying, uh, staying away from too much pleasure, for example. All of these things combine to lead us to the ultimate end result, which is spirituality, which is having a higher sense of connection to our Lord, to our Creator, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our ultimate purpose, our ultimate being. Therefore, these are the main conversations that we hope to have in the next uh, few nights. We'll be having this conversation in the first 15 days of Shahr al-Ramadan. And I believe that this is the best time to have this conversation so that we can implement the fruits of this conversation in our lives so that we can actually have better lives, not only for ourselves, but for our families, for our friends, for our communities at large. Because if we don't adopt these traits now, when will we do this? When will we adopt the traits of clarity, of tafakkur, of tadabbur, the traits of that Islam, the akhlaqi, ethical traits that Islam has encouraged. And how will we get to spirituality of our Lord? Because, because clearly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, Allah bidhikrillahi tatma'inna al that verily in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do the hearts find tranquility. Our world is starving for tranquility today. Our world has an abundance of knowledge, an abundance of information. All the insights are out there. In fact, one may say they are drowning in information. But we're starving for wisdom. We're starving for tranquility in life. And I'm here to argue that religion, and in particular Islam, and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, and the teachings of the Quran Al Majid wa Furqan Al Hamid, can help you and I in order through the remembrance of Allah get tranquility in our hearts and in our minds. And this tranquility will allow you to have peace and your families and your friends to have peace and your, our communities to have peace, even if economic times are hard as they are now, even if material times are hard as they are now. We can get through this. We will get through this, inshallah, bismillah. But I know it's a tough time. It's a very difficult time for many people. I'm getting many messages, many friends, many dear ones, many connections, many friends of friends, many loved ones, many of our community members are losing loved ones. It's an unprecedented time. We have not seen anything like this in our lifetimes. And this is something where we have to control the one thing that we do have control over. And that is our minds. So that we can have control over ourselves. The spirit and the meaning of Shahra Ramadan this blessed month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has called his own month. The blessings of this month is that it gives us time to introspect, to control our nafs, to control our soul, not only through food and drink, but controlling our desires, controlling our minds, so that we can have control over our lives. And so that we can actually move to a better place, a better world. One, the one thing that you and I have control over is our minds. Viktor Frankl, who was a man, who was a psychologist and a psychiatrist who had gone through concentration camps, he wrote the book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. And in his analysis, he was looking at himself as an observer. He was observing himself from a third person point of view. 
That is, he was looking at himself and seeing what is happening inside of him and in his mind going through a difficult circumstance. And he said that the one thing that a person can be deprived of or cannot be deprived of, that you can take everything from someone. You can take their house, you can take their property, you can take their family, you can take everything that they have. You cannot take one thing away from an individual. And that is their mind, their ability to think that you have control over that. And if you and I and we adopt control over our minds, it will lead us to success, not only in our personal lives, not only in our academic lives, not only in our professional lives, but by virtue of it, we will have more tranquility in our communities, in our societies, in our own Muslim Shia communities, but also in our states, in our countries. Why is it that in some of our own societies, we've had challenges with, with respect to leadership? This, I would argue, is because of it, lack of intellectual humility and how important this is. We'll be discussing this in subsequent nights. Also, the lack of understanding of how to think rationally and clearly. Many of these tools can be utilized so that we can actually live better lives. And my hope is through these conversations, we actually create a better society, a more tranquil society, a more egalitarian society, and a better society. Because after this situation that we're facing globally of this pandemic, our world will be different. Our world will not be the same. And we will have a say in what type of world it becomes through our voices, through our writings, through our stands, and through what we say. And my hope is that through the conversations that we have in this series of discussions, you and I will be at a better place at the end of these discussions than we were at the beginning, so that we can make an active and a beneficial contribution to ourselves, our societies, our communities at large, through adopting philosophy, ethics, and the ultimate goal of ours, spirituality in our lives through the light of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam I hope that this has been a good summary of what we're going to cover inshallah and from the next conversation we will delve into the depths of what are the actual steps that we can implement in order to have a better life and actually have greater happiness, contentment and tranquility in our lives. I hope to see you soon in our subsequent discussions inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.